Good morning and you're very welcome, welcome to this morning signpost webinar, which is brought to you in association with National Rural Network, Dairy Sustainability Ireland and Food Drink Ireland Skillnet. Uh, this morning, we're going to be joined by uh, Dr. Ewan Mullins, Head of Crop Science Department at, at Oak Park. Ewan, you're very welcome. Good morning, Pat. Uh, we're also joined uh, to help with questions by Kieran Collins, uh, tillage specialist in the south southwest. Yep, south pass, yeah. South. Okay, uh, you're very welcome. Uh, what's the weather like down there? Oh, nice and frosty. I'm sure the same <laughs> yeah. as everywhere. Right across the country, a crisp one. Uh, probably helps with with uh, pest control, you. Yeah, absolutely. It's one of the things we haven't had these sorts of cold snaps in a couple of years. And they definitely knock back aphids and other pests. So while people may be giving out this morning with the roads, there, there is a bit of a silver lining there. OK, you will be talking to us this morning. Uh, I think that your title is a step by step developing integrated pest management strategies uh, to reduce chemical use. I suppose with the predominance of uh, climate change in the in the headlines, this is a really important target. In, in terms of, of sustainability of agriculture that often doesn't get the airplay that it probably deserves. Is, is that a fair comment? Yeah, it is. No, you're correct, Pat. The, there, there, there is a big drive from, I suppose, uh, processors, uh, consumer, public sentiment. And that's also mirrored by European regulations, which is a drive to reduce inputs in our cropping systems. But okay. there is a trade-off, which we okay, and and this is the first of a, of a couple of of tillage focused uh, uh, webinars that we'll be having over the the, the next couple of weeks. So, uh, you and if you want to go ahead and and share and and give your presentation, perfect. You should be able to see the opening. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. So, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you for taking the time to listen in this morning. So. When you see a title uh, such as this, uh, Developing Integrated Pest Management Strategies or IPM Strategies to Reduce Chemical Inputs, I suppose one of the, the obvious questions is why do we need chemical inputs? Well, we actually have uh, an excellent climate for plant growth and that drives fantastic yield returns uh, in our tillage sector. For example, winter wheat this year just gone, 11 tonnes per hectare was the average. Um, and they are really, really significant yields. In fact, some of the best yields in the world uh, are recorded from our tillage sector here in Ireland. And the reason for that, of course, is our climate. We're sitting on the, the western seaboard of Europe. We have a maritime climate and, and typically a very pleasant climate, with maybe the exception of, of this morning. And we get, a, we get quite a lot of rain. We get generally mild temperatures. And we tend not to get too many extreme uh, bouts of our climate, although we are starting to see more drought during, during spring periods, and that can have an impact on yield. So our climate is driving great uh, plant growth. We, we see it not just in our crops, but obviously in our, in our pastures as well. But the flip side to that is that the climate we have is ideal for diseases. In fact, it's, it's, it's an interesting note to make is that we have researchers all over Europe who come to our research center here in Oak Park and breeding companies send material here to evaluate its disease potential because of the levels of disease we have in Ireland. Um, if you're a, a plant pathogen, in particular a fungus, you would just love to be in Ireland. So diseases such as Rhynchosporium on the left hand side that um, you can see here, uh, you can see the, the, the leaves are, are discolored. And in the middle, we have ramularia, which is the almost like a shotgun effect on the leaves. And on the right, late blight of potato. In regards to the, the cereal diseases and indeed late blight of potato, farmers have to spray to, to mitigate the impact of these diseases. Another disease is septoria of wheat. <clears throat> uh, this is a picture taken from a control plot in Oak Park last year. So there's no fungicides here. And indeed, on the previous three images, there's, there was, these were, they were control plots, so no chemicals used. And you can see the immediate impact. And in terms of septoria of wheat, it migrates up through the crop during the growth season. And you can see on the leaf, basically, the destruction of, of the, the photosynthetic capacity of the leaf. Now, that's, that's really important. And you might be looking at it and thinking, well, there's grains in the head. Everything looks fine. But what happens is the, the leaves are effectively the factories. They produce the sugars through photosynthesis during the growing season, and those sugars get translocated or transferred up into the grains. So if you get heavy leaf damage, 
if you get heavy disease pressure, you will have a reduced yield and quality of, of, of the product. BYDV in our cereals, barley yellow dwarf virus, was very prominent in 2022, maybe just one of the main reasons probably was also due to the mild winter we had from 21 into 22. And the aphids, which are the vector of the disease, they overwintered and we tend to get a greater prominence of, of the yellowing across the crop. So it was, it was very obvious in the spring of 22. And all these diseases are, are, are prevalent, they're, they're there. And we need the, the chemical inputs in our current systems to support that yield and the quality potential, because ultimately that's what's driving profitability. And without that, enter tillage enterprises will not be profitable and hence their continued existence is unsustainable. So IPM, IPM is, is mentioned a lot at the moment. Um, uh, and if you go to Google there's and you put in IPM, there's lots of different definitions of it. But in essence, what it comes down to, it's, it's an approach to use multiple control practices or agents to maintain the population of diseases at a level that minimizes any economic impo impact to the farmer, but also minimizes any environmental and our associated health risks of using plant protection products. So the goal of IPM is to effectively use as many techniques out there, be they physical, cultural, biological, and indeed chemical. So it, it, it is not about removing the use of pesticides 100%. It's, it's really about having a system in place that justifies the use of the chemicals after everything else has been exhausted or tried. So the default is not to use uh, chemicals with IPM. The, the default is to try various different steps along the way so that you can manage those pests uh, in a sustainable way as much as possible. So the important point to make about IPM is that it really is a case by case, depending on the crop, depending on the pest or the pathogen involved. And there is no silver bullet. In fact, IPM is about several bronze bullets and working together to try and knock back the, the pest and pathogen population. And again, to, to, to ring fence the yield potential of the crop so that we maintain profitability. It's not a new concept. It's been around for, for over near almost 60 years. The first time it was recorded uh, was back in 1967 when Smitten and Van den Bosch introduced the concept of IPM. And since then it has evolved. But the pyramid here, or, or the IPM pyramid we have here, you can see the various steps in that starting at the bottom, you start out with cultural control and key to that, and which will focus on a lot of the talk this morning is around resistant or tolerant cultivars, because it's not, not by any accident, they're in the bottom here and effectively they are the cornerstone of the IPM pyramid and IPM is the cornerstone of the farm to fork strategy. So, it's a simple take home message that we have to have more resilient, more robust varieties in our systems to support IPM practices. But that's not the only thing we have to do. In terms of as you make your way up through cultural control into prognosis and forecasting systems, we have to be aware, fully aware of what's out there. We have to be able to rapidly diagnose the presence and absence of disease, sometimes when there's no visible symptoms on the plant. We need to develop decision support systems that will assist farmers in that decision to spray. So, and then at the top, you have biological and physical um, agents that you can use to control. And then chemical is also there as well. But as you see, the pyramid gets smaller and smaller as you get to the top, so that that decision to spray is the last resort. So that's, that's in essence, the, 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 what IPM is, the theory of IPM. So why is there an extra emphasis on it now? Well, as I said, farm to fork earlier is the, one of the main agendas from the European Green Deal. And farm to fork's focus is to reduce by 50% the use and risk of chemical pesticides by 2030. Now that, that is uh, an extremely ambitious, bordering on uh, aspirational target when you look at where we are right now. So if farm to fork was introduced on Monday morning, we would have serious problems um, in, our, in our tillage systems. So there was a draft sustainable regulation, our SUR was published in June of this year, and that effectively has outlined how the promotion of IPM is essential in terms of developing and achieving the objectives uh, to reduce the, the chemical pesticides that, that are currently in use. 
So as I said, getting back to the pyramid, we have step by step step by step actions. And then what I'm going to talk about now are, are some of the breathing approaches that we've been utilizing in Oak Park with partners and uh, collaborations across Europe, but also the exciting work done around the diagnostics and the pest and pathogen surveillance. <clears throat> this is only a little snapshot of some of the work we're doing. And as a model, what I focused in on uh, is the potato breeding program we have here. We have a very successful breeding program going back over 50 years, but, but breeding takes time. So it doesn't matter whether you're breeding potatoes or cereals, the average time for a cereal variety would be approximately 10 years. So the varieties for 2032 are going to be started, were started this year. So you really have to be looking ahead as in terms of strategies to see what's coming down the line. And obviously farm to fork goals are, are the, one of the biggest challenges we have. This is a diagram which captures very well the breeding program, uh, potato breeding program we have here in, in Oak Park, led by Dennis Griffin <clears throat> and Dan Milborn. Dan, the, the, the slide itself, as you can see, we start out in year one with about 200 parents and a very simple crossing taking pollen from one flower to the other. In year one, then there's over 100,000 candidates uh, are evaluated. Now, the logistics of that alone are, are, are really significant. But as you make your way down year after year after year, you start to, to decrease that number down to 75,000. And by year five, you're down to 70. But ultimately, when you get to year 12, you're looking at one to three varieties coming out of that, that on average 12 year program. And what's interesting is on the right hand side, you see the product profile. There's over 40 characteristics that are needed to meet the demands of both processors, consumers, et cetera. So there, there's huge pressure to ensure that the delivery of the material ticks all of the boxes that are required. Now, the process takes time um, and uh, it's delivered fantastic varieties. Obviously, as people will know, Rooster is, is one of, one of the, the most popular varieties out there. But can the process be accelerated? Can disease resistance be identified in a way that makes it more streamlined to get that material out through the program? And the program has had um, great success in regards to developing PCN resistance. And one variety is Buster, um, mar we marketed through Irish potato marketing. But on the diagram on the left, sorry, on, on the top right, you'll see these little eggs or cysts on the root. And PCN or potato cyst nematode is an important pest. The problem with it is that once it comes into a field, um, that field effectively is taken, needs to be taken out of production because the eggs will, will, will persist for some time. So using marker assisted selection, which in a way is, is effectively a DNA fingerprinting technique, um, Dan and his team have been able to identify individual genes for resistance to PCN, as you can see on the top left, H1, GPA5, and GPA6, et cetera. And then crossing material that has each of these, they effectively pool the genes into one particular variety at the bottom. And that's Buster, that contains all six of these genes, H1, GRP, GPA2, et cetera. That process would not be possible without this rapid cycle breeding that they've developed here in the marker assisted selection. And that's just one example of how you can use molecular techniques um, to deliver more resistance into material. Of course, we're all familiar with late blight disease, Phytophthora infestans hasn't gone away. Each year, farmers have to spray 10, 11, 12 times to try and knock back late blight in the potato crop, which will destroy a crop if it gets in and establish, establishes itself. The images here are just the, the, the leaves with spores that have landed on them on the right hand side. You can see all the white fluffy material around the lesion. And that's basically the, the, the aerial spore or the aerial hyphae developing the spores with wind and rain get spread through the canopy and very, very quickly will destroy a crop. So the farmer has to spray at the moment because there aren't resistant material available for mainstream commercial growers. However, there are sources of late blight resistance out there. Potato originated from Central and South America. And this is a, an image or a, 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 an infographic or sorry, an art of obviously South America and Central America. And each of these red dots are populations of wild potato species. So wild potato originated here, it grows wild in hedgerows and sides of fields, et cetera, and, and mountain sides. And this material has very strong resistance to late blight because it's co-evolved over hundreds, thousands of years. 
And what's now possible is using the techniques such as marker assisted selection to identify it and other novel breeding techniques, it is possible to take the sources of resistance from these wild species and transfer them into conventional. So as part of the, the breeding program here, <clears throat> Dennis has been using material and using conventional uh, breeding techniques. And what's, what's really exciting is coming through the breeding program. This is a, a, a late blight trial drone shot taken in, in the summer or September of this year. And what you can see is obviously on the outside, all of the, the, the brown patches that are the, the material that maybe it was identified with, with some partial resistance to late blight or there's control plots there, but you can see they've been completely destroyed. However, there's quite a lot of green there, which means there's some really high value potential material coming through the breeding program, which is in itself very exciting. The process though takes time, as I said, you know, you're looking at about 10 to 12 years. So can we accelerate that potato breeding process? Can it be brought on so to the point where you can validate these sources of resistance quicker um, in a matter of maybe one to two years and, and, and work on it from there? And indeed the answer is yes. So we were involved in a project several years ago using a novel breeding technique called cisgenics and not getting into the detail of it, but very simply that approach allows you to cut or excise one of those wild potato genes and transfer it into a, uh, an existing variety. And the goal of the work was to, was to validate the source of resistance against iris strains of late blight. And we did trials in 2013, 2014, and 2015. And what you can see is on the left-hand side are the control plots. And on the right-hand side is the exact same variety, a variety called Desiree with that single resistance gene called VNT1. And again in 2015. What was very important with this work though is that uh, an IPM approach and strategy was developed and indeed it was and it was published and the impact of that particular resistance gene is clear from the drone shot here. So as you can see Desiree uh, in the, the brown squared highlighted plots complete crop destruction, um, no foliage left as a result of the late blight and then we have the, the same variety with 10 to 11 sprays of fungicide, which is the white circled plots, Desiree and fungicide, very good return on yields, because of course the crop has been protected by the, by the, the chemical inputs. And then in the green, the green shaded plots, what we have is the same variety again, Desiree with no fungicide, but it does have that single gene taken from a wild species. That, and that process can be done through a new breeding technique, but importantly, it could also be done through conventional breeding. It's just that it obviously takes a lot longer to, to do it. And this, this was a proof of concept study, uh, and that was all it was. But what it did do is it did demonstrate the ability of these sources of resistance to deliver, but also the, import, the importance, the ability to deliver reductions in, in, in plant protection products. So if you develop a new variety uh, that has resistance to whatever disease, be it late blight or septorian in winter wheat, that's really only the start of, of, of the story. You then have to maintain that resistance because of course, all these diseases, they're constantly evolving. We saw it with COVID. We have new strains of COVID evolving over time. And, and as a pop, as, a, as I suppose we're, the global population are now fully aware that we see COVID evolving and plant diseases are, are no different. Um, they will evolve the more pressure you put on them. Uh, so that's why an IPM approach, you have to throw out multiple different approaches to try and knock back the ability, the adaptability of the pathogen to evolve. What's very important though, is that you survey and you diagnose the disease. So surveillance is absolutely essential for IPM because you have to know what's out there. You have to be able to respond quickly um, because if you develop a resistant variety, it will work, uh, but then you need to make sure that it continues to work because if it doesn't, you're at crop failure, and then you're effectively eroding any goodwill or any confidence that producers will have in an IPM approach. So to show you some of the work that's been ongoing here, Stephen Kilday, as part of his program, um, has worked with Met Aaron and introduced a, a new, um, a new uh, app, or sorry, a new a forecasting system for late blight. So we'd all be familiar uh, with MetAaron telling us that there's a risk of late blight. But now if you go to the MetAaron website, there is a new real-time map, which is constantly responding to what we call effective blight arrows. So you have light green, yellow, orange, and red. So red basically is a high risk that there is um, uh, potential 
for the spread of blight within a certain area. And you can click on a, your region on the map um, and you get various different graphs as well, which will give you more information. Obviously, if you're in a low risk area, that does not mean that there is zero risk. Uh, and what this, this approach is with MetAaron, and it will be built on over time again with, with more information, it's building into a decision support tool. And, and the most important word there in that uh, phrase is support because it gives us more information about the weather. As I said at the start, our weather really promotes the uh, disease pressure. So this particular model that's used now with MetAaron, and at the moment, when you look at it this morning, the whole of Ireland is green, obviously, because this is not good weather for late blight. But back in September, we had days where most of uh, Ireland, or predominantly three quarters of it, would be covered in red to orange. So there is a, a much higher risk of, of the conditions being inducive for, for the spread of blight. So these decision support systems are really important for IPM because farmers and producers need to know what is the weather forecast. Obviously, that sounds almost simplistic, but how relevant is that weather forecast to promote the spread of the disease that we want to control within our crops? So moving on to BYDV, in terms of aphid surveillance, I mentioned surveillance and diagnostics. The grain aphid in this fabulous photo taken by Max, one of our PhD students here in Oak Park, um, the grain aphid is a vector for BYDV, barley yellow dwarf virus. And, and previous work done by Chagas has shown that there is a resistant clone, an uh, insecticide resistant clone of, of the grain aphid at, at low numbers, but it is out there. And in addition to that, the EU has banned the use of neonicotinoids, which are there as an insecticide. So there is a much higher threat of yield loss in, in our barley crops due to the spread of BYDV. And a recent paper by Louise McNamara shows that that potential loss for BYDV uh, across all of the research papers published on it can be well above 30%. So it, it is a really important disease. And but we have many questions about it. Um, how many aphids are out there? Um, their migration patterns? How effective are they at transmitting BYDV? And of course, the question is, does every aphid have BYDV? So these are very important fundamental questions and again, I'm going to come back to COVID because when COVID started first, we knew very little about it. We didn't know if you have COVID and if you do have COVID, are you more uh, um, prone to it in terms of your immune system? But also, are you a, a potential super spreader? Um, can you spread it without showing any symptoms? And all of these questions, and indeed, it's exactly the same when it comes to BYDV and aphids. So we've invested heavily in, in establishing a surveillance and a monitoring system. And what's exciting is that it's, it's very applied in terms of the infrastructure. We have the sample suction towers at three locations, down in Cork, Carlow, and outside Dublin. But what we're doing is we're integrating the molecular side of things in terms of disease diagnostics. Um, and so we have Louise McNamara in terms of the entomology, her team, and then we have Stephen Byrne and his team in terms of the molecular diagnostics. And they've established a very, very important uh, and, and informative system that will allow us and is allowing us to identify and, and look more at the, 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 the epidemiology of the aphid and also the progress, progression of disease. So this is just a plot of one of those towers of total aphid numbers through 2021. So there are, there are as you can see, the, the higher the bar, the more the aphids. But what was very interesting is that the, the green part of the bar are aphids that are BYDV negative, and don't have that insecticide resistance. So the majority of the aphids do not carry the, the BYDV. However, when you look towards the top of each of the bar, you start to see the pink and the, and the brown, and the pink is aphids that are BYDV positive and also positive for the insecticide, whereas the orange are aphids that are BYDV positive but are not insecticide resistant. So they, they, they could be controlled with a standard pyrethroid spray. So this sort of information is really important because we need to know when the aphids are, are flying, when they're migrating, but also we need to know what is the BYDV load within the environment. And by integrating the molecular diagnostic work with the sampling, this information is now, is now available. This work, when you then layer on top of it more uh, weather data and climate data, it becomes um, more insightful. So this is what's called a bubble plot. Um, the bigger the bubbles, the more the number of, of aphids. And if you look over on the left-hand side, from the top, we have zero. So the top line is zero rain, so obviously no rainfall. But as you go from left to right, you get an increase in temperature 
going from approximately five degrees up to 25 degrees. So in the absence of rain, with higher temperatures, we get more aphids flying, um, which will make sense because obviously uh, aphids don't like to fly in the rain and the warmer temperatures induces them to move around. But as the rainfall increases and as the temperature decreases, you start to see less bubbles down in the bottom half of the graph. So all of this layer after layer is feeding into the decision support system that we do plan to develop for BYDV and working closely with colleagues across Europe to do this. There are models out there, but of course, the key thing is that the model is not a, an all fits one. Uh, it's going to give information. It's going to inform and give insight into the potential for a flight at a certain time. But of course, it does require surveillance in the fields as well. So building that decision support system, just to give you an idea, one of the, the, the towers here in Oak Park, <clears throat> you can see the, the middle picture with it captures the, the aphids in at the top, uh, suck, and it sucks them down to the bottom into these collection vessels. And when you open up a collection vessel, this is what you'll typically see, um, lots of bugs in there. And the manual way is to tease them out as the student is doing under the microscope. And that is very laborious, uh, very intensive work. It is needed to be done at the start um, and has been done by the team here in Oak Park. But what is needed is a single test. So to monitor, so you take that sample, you split it into one half to the freezer and the other half is ground up. And from that, then you can have one test to look at the aphid diversity. Is it the grain aphid? Is it a different type of aphid? The presence and absence of insecticide resistance within the aphid population in the sample is a BYDV positive or negative, and of real interest is the strain of BYDV. Since this work has started in the last two years, we're getting we're lifting the lid on the diversity of BYDV, which is going to be really important. Um, and this single test is being developed in Oak Park, and they're making great strides. And in the next six to twelve months, we would hope that it be validated to the point where it will give us more information that we can then use to ultimately build that, that decision support system. So looking ahead, I suppose the, the focus for us is, is on generating model varieties. So, so what we have to do is IPM is, is a fundamental shift in thinking and in production for crops in Ireland and the whole way across Europe. Um, the solution for many, many years, decades has always been in a can on a shelf. And through farm to fork, the driver, which is, is making this change, is that there has to be a fundamental shift. And for us to, to, to I suppose, to ensure from the, our, our KT colleagues and, and, and education in terms of the demonstration of IPM, it's incumbent on us to develop these model varieties with robust biotic resistance, like whatever disease it's going to be, be it a, a model variety in barley or wheat or potato or, or beans so that IPM can be demonstrated. But it's not just having that genetic resistance, it needs to have more because a variety managed in a certain way may not perform the way to it would perform to its potential. So putting varieties that are resistant, ensuring that there is a, 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 an appropriate and suitable rotation, these are all parts of successful IPM strategies. The impact of the SUR and farm to fork will be significant. There's, there's no point in trying to doctor it up uh, in any other way. Uh, and that is work that we will be looking at in the, in the, in the near term, is to look at the, the social and the economic impact that it will have. And most importantly, to look at the, the, the measures to mitigate those so that the profitability is maintained. The resistance management, as I just said, is, is absolutely essential. So in line with our work on the breeding side, we're ramping up resources into the pathogen and, and, and disease diagnostics. As I said, again, and I have to emphasize that the decision support tools that are there are really support. Um, um, they're not, a, it's not a black and white, it's constant information. Uh, and those, whatever models are developed in time, those models will, be, will have to be validated constantly with more data coming in to improve the accuracy, et cetera, of them. And ultimately, of course, the goal of one of the goals of farm to fork is to protect biodiversity. And through this, the goal is to address the, the pesticide reduction targets that are that are being placed on us. So I've come to the end of the talk. Um, I, all I've given is, is a real short snapshot of the fantastic work being done by colleagues here in the team in Oak Park um, and with our colleagues, the specialists and advisors. That whole uh, community in Chagas uh, 
is working to try and deliver IPM strategies in advance of 2030. But it is a really, really significant challenge. I would encourage you to, if you look for more information on this, to go to our website and also at the crops, the Chagas Crops YouTube channel as well, where there's loads of different videos and, and the majority of our outputs are, are put up there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Ewan. You might just stop sharing your presentation there. Sure. Uh, really fascinating. I have my suspicions that you could have gone on all day if we'd <laughs> given you the, the, the space, but... Uh, they, they were just the introductory slides. I, yeah, I love the presentation. <laughs> I, get, I get that sense. Um, if there are people out there who think that uh, IPM is, nah, that's not for me, I'll stick with the, the chemistry. Will the, I suppose, the uh, slowness of, of new chemistry coming on stream and the speed at which the chemistry has been removed at the other end legislatively mean that it, that's not an option into the future? Or, or is that a, a, a way of looking at it? So, sorry, Pat, just can you repeat that for me? Yeah, sorry. just I'm just wondering if, 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 uh, is IPM, uh, if anybody is kind of saying, well, that's not really for me, I prefer to stick to the chemistry solution, but I suppose what I'm asking is, is yeah. the speed at which chemistry is being taken out okay. at one end and the slowness of which new chemistry is coming in, yeah. does it really mean that that's not going to be an option for the future? So the, the, there will be chemistries in the future. The, I mean, there, there has to be. Um, and that's because they, they are needed there in that worst case scenario where the control, the, we would have seen, for example, in, in some years, if, if we have a very mild, humid, damp, wet, uh, early summer period, the disease pressure is enormous. Um, and we have seen material here that we would have worked with breeding companies in Europe in winter wheat um, that has very good durability against septoria. Um, and it's not, it's not complete resistance. So resistance itself is, is almost like an immunity. Um, and if that immunity breaks down, as I said, it's complete, you're effectively back to square one. So if you have, if you have tolerance or increased tolerance, you have a better chance of, of withstanding the, the disease. But you then would need a chemistry application on top of that. So the potato is also a good example with that work with, with VNT1, which is that wild potato gene. Um, the IPM model that was developed with that uh, showed that, yeah, it, it, it was going to give very good disease protection against late blight. But there was one year at one time of the year when the IPM trigger was suggesting it one spray. So, but you're going from 11 sprays down to one spray, but you still need the sprays on the shelf as a just in case scenario. Otherwise, you're, you're putting an awful lot of work and effort into breeding resistance, um, and you're, you need to protect that as well. So, so to answer your question, while well, number of, of chemi chemistries are being reduced, and they are across Europe, um, they are still needed. They are a very important part of, of crop production. Okay, I just remind you to, to submit your questions on the, uh, in the Q&A. Kieran, a, a number yeah. of questions coming in. There there, there, there's one I have here, you one, and I suppose it, it kind of reminds me when when I started in in this game, we nearly had an upside down pyramid. You know, we looked into the chemical store, mm -hmm. and yeah. you know that was it. And I suppose you focused a lot on IPM and the pyramid, and I suppose the availability of good genetic material obviously is mm -hmm. is key to that. So I suppose the question that I have here is do we have enough good genetic material and is there enough coming on stream to help us reach our targets of 50% of reduction in pesticide use? Yeah, okay. So the first part, do we have enough gen genetic material? For certain crop breeding programs, we do. Um, now it's akin to how long is a piece of string uh, because you know what is the ideal genetic material? But what is most encouraging is that while breeding efforts in, in, in several crops wasn't as 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 much a priority maybe for the last from through the 90s into 2000s the main focus has been on driving yield in terms of breeding in terms of disease resistance there are many collections out there um heritage collections for example we were looking at one as part of a project here called healthy oats looking at a heritage collection of oats with varieties going back to the late 1800s early 1900s so this material is available um and that's encouraging because you only get out of a breeding program what you put into it. Um, so it is really important. So that material is available. 
Um, and we work closely with breeders all over Europe. We, we don't have a serial breeding program here in Chagas. We, we don't intend to establish one, but we do have very important collaborations with breeders. So we put a, quite a bit of effort into looking at pre-breeding material in terms of its disease uh, potential for whatever diseases in barley or wheat or, or whatever else, potato as well. Sorry, Pat, if I, while I have the floor, yeah, I have could, could I add a, a follow up to that? You would, I suppose you, you gave a very good example of the length of time that it takes to go from the parent material to something, mm. you know, that's suitable in the field. Are there, you know, processes and that that we can accelerate that and, mm. and maybe how available are they to us? Yeah. OK, so the what you're what you're asking there really is about, I suppose, the new breeding techniques and, and GMOs across Europe. Um, so th there are techniques available. Yes. The answer to your question is yes. The, the material or the techniques are available. Um, the research literature is loaded with examples demonstrating the utility of, of more modern approaches such as CRISPR-Cas and gene editing. Um, at the moment, that material is, de well, it is not at the moment, it is the European Court of Justice ruled that uh, edited material is, is a GMO and must be labelled as such. Um, but what we've seen is that, as I showed here with, with the cisgenic approach, which is a form, a new breeding technique, is that you can very quickly accelerate the, the, the ability to deliver material. So the standard conventional way you're looking at 12-ish years, roughly on average, for a new variety in potato, about 10 years for cereals. We know using cisgenics in potato, you could reduce that down to probably four, maybe five years, six years. Um, and what you're doing is, with these new breeding techniques, you have the ability to take existing varieties uh, that tick all those boxes that we had there around quality and what the consumer wants, processor wants, and you can integrate in an additional trait. So you, what you're doing is you're enhancing the, the ability of an existing variety, which is already meeting the demands that are needed by the market. So, and you can do that in a much shorter time span. So that, that, is, that is a huge um, asset to have, um, but Europe needs to work through systems to ensure, obviously, to, to maintain all the rigors of, of safety around, around food production uh, across Europe that have been there that we rely so much on. Um, that process of evaluation uh, and Europe is in the process of looking at that through 2023. Just, I suppose you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, GMOs and is uh, there's a lot of, of people very scarred from a, a lot of the, the mm. arguments that, that took place. Uh, you hear less, I suppose, than you would have a number of years ago in the public press anyway. Is yeah. that a, a, given what we're facing and uh, what we're trying to do, uh, is it an or is it a, a topic that needs to be opened up again in terms of what is defined as as a GMO and and uh, and the val validity of using it as as a technique? Yeah, well, I I, uh, I think the best thing to do is just refer to what the European Commission said last year and the year before. You know, they were very clear in their language when they said the evaluation of of material and the processing uh, of material through the regulatory pipeline in Europe is not fit for purpose. Um, and that's that's very strong language from the European Commission to make that that statement. Um, we have a really big challenge with farm to fork. I mean, it can't be understated. And and <laughs> that, don't be too doomy and gloomy. But then you put climate change on top of that, um, and and either one of those would be significant. And you put the two of them together, um, we're facing big big challenges across Europe in terms of food security and food production. So when you face any big challenge, the best way to de-risk that challenge is to ensure that you adopt and, and, and investigate all of the techniques that are available on the table. Um, and it, you know, there, it's not a one fits all. In certain approaches, uh, a technique may, a breeding technique may be very applicable. In other approaches, it may be not. But to come back to the IPM though, it's important to say that, that while you, you, the breeding and the genetics are, are, the, are the foundation of it, they are not the only thing. It's really important that all the other aspects of that IPM pyramid are included um, because it's it's integrating all these techniques together is, is the key thing. And, and I suppose when you talk, you talk about the integration of those and, and that's going to, I suppose, require a lot of assistance, a lot of decision mm -hmm. support systems. Are we putting enough resources into developing those sides of the, of the equation so that farmers can feel confident? Because I suppose... Yeah. Chemistry is could be considered by many as a, as an insurance policy. It, you, you're fairly sure it works. 
Whereas with a lot of the other techniques, you're you're just wondering a little bit and maybe a little unsure. Yeah, no, you're right. And I mean, I, I mentioned that it's a fundamental shift in thinking about about how to produce crops and how to grow them. Um, as I said, the default has always been to apply out the chemistry. It has to change completely. Um, and and Stephen Calais often talks about the planning about picking the variety, sitting down, looking at a variety's performance, not just on the farm, looking at the recommended list, digesting all the information that's out there. Um, it may be that a variety choice that you had previously um, is not that suitable and you need to maybe look at something else in terms of an IPM approach. The decision support tools, the, the surveillance, the monitoring, all the things that I, that I talked about here for, for two diseases, late blight and, and BYDV, they're, they're essential. They're, they're, they're that background information that, that is needed to inform the decisions that farmers will make. But key for the farm for producers is going to be monitoring and surveilling, monitoring their own fields, their own area, because the decision support tool is not going to come down to the granularity of, of, of a one hectare level uh, in a particular region. So, and even within uh, a field, there could be different things going on within the dynamics and the microclimate of the field. So farmers are going to have to put more time into, into monitoring their crops. That, that's, that's a given. So there are tools to do that. Obviously, the easiest is to, to walk around the crops, but that inquiry requires a huge amount, like requires an investment of time. Um, and for some, that may not be possible. So there are other options out there, and we are looking at other things such as drones, etc. So it's, it's multi-layered and multidisciplinary. But I suppose the take-home message is that it's going to be very different. And when we get to 2032 or 2035, it'll be a very different system than it is than it is today. So I suppose a message off the sprayer and down onto your feet, onto the crops. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. a good few yeah. questions coming in there. Yeah. There is, there's, I suppose there's, there's a few here together. I might bundle up in one. It's kind of, is there work going on in Ireland with regards to using the likes of beneficial fungi, maybe inoculations and the whole area of plant help to reduce pathogen load on plants? No, there is, there is work in Ireland and there's a huge amount of work going in across Europe. So, so the, the pathogens and diseases that I talked about there are, are basically one agents in a community that's uh, within the environment. And obviously, BYDV has not, or sorry, aphids, which spread BYDV, have natural predators, ladybirds and others. Um, so we have done work on, on I suppose, more um, techniques such as using those predators to try and keep disease pressures down. But in terms of biological agents, there's, you know, seed coating, there, there's many, many uh, agents out there. One of the key things, though, is that we need more information about the efficacy of these um we need to have more validations so and that's that's really important and it comes back to the point that pat made when you're applying a chemistry you know it's going to work um and with with all the other things that are non-chemical they they they'll they'll all contribute a certain amount um but they they won't have that 100 percent efficacy that that chemistry has so that's why it's key if you're you know if there's a biological it's then added with a cultural or another physical or a different approach as well. Yeah. Uh, a question there, uh, I suppose, uh, at the extreme end of the, 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 well, not extreme, but would it be easier to go organic and cut out all of the plant protection products? So there, there is a drive farm to fork is, has another target in there is to increase organic production. Um, and and that's that's a European goal and a mandate. And obviously within Ireland, Chagas has put resources into, into the organic uh, KT as well. Um, and we have work here in terms of the weed control um, because that is a problem in, in, in organic systems. So if we, it, the, the question itself is, is to move all to organic systems. The, I suppose it's, it, the irony here is that by, by reducing chemical use, uh, as we are in farm to fork, we're, we're moving away from chemistries and there's a natural, I suppose, transition that will occur there. Whether farmers decide to go for full certification for organic systems, uh, that's a decision they'll have to make on, on an individual enterprise basis. Okay. Uh, and you, you mentioned weed control there, and I suppose we're, uh, in a lot of people's minds, and it's it's not just a grass tillage, it's, I suppose, in grassland as well, yeah. the, 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 the potential removal of, of Roundup and glyphosate yeah. uh, is going to be a, a, a very significant challenge for, for the oh, yeah. industry. 
Yeah, and, and that that would be that would be really really significant and really serious. So the within Europe at the moment, obviously, uh, I think there's a meeting next week on the continuation of glyphosate, um, and the mood music is that it may be another year. Um, so so systems need to be designed in, in terms of you know if we don't have glyphosate available, what what can be done? What are the options there? Um, and in terms of grass weed control, as you mentioned, like black grass is a really serious pest. Uh, when it can, when it establishes, it can take fields out of production very quickly. And one of the only ways to eradicate it uh, is to go in with glyphosate. So that's a clear example where you do need a chemistry like that for a worst case scenario. If you take that worst case scenario away, you are looking at putting that field um, which might have been returning, you know, 10, 11 tons per hectare of winter wheat, you're going to be looking at changing that production into, into something, you know, it could be, it might have to go into grassland for several years to try and keep the black grass down. Um, so that's a really significant shift in the production potential of that field, you know, on a, on a, on a tillage enterprise. I suppose you and on a follow up to that, I suppose somebody meant spoke here about the adaptability of pests. And I suppose another example used there was barley yellow dwarf virus and yeah. resistance build up in with yeah. within aphids, I suppose. Maybe just a comment on IPM there and how the role it has to play. Yeah, because I mean it with when when the neonicotinoids were were removed, um pyretrides are all that's left. So you know you're you're down to the last the last chemical option there. Um and Thankfully, the, the progression of that insecticide resistance hasn't, hasn't advanced. And, and that's uh, all that, that uh, monitoring and surveillance that was done and that is being done at the moment is keeping a, a close eye on, on that. But when you get that adaptability of a pest against a particular control action, um, you need to have others in the back pocket. Uh, and that's where I suppose various different approaches and IPM are really important. Uh, another, I suppose, really good example is the work done uh, by Stephen on septoria, because we know septoria can evolve very quickly against certain chemistries. We saw it with distributorins. Um, but managing that the use of those individual chemistries is really important to maintaining their longevity. Yeah. And they're, they're, they're just patting the questions there. Just uh, people have come up with a few examples. I think dock beetles is something I, I, I don't know if there's much work done yet to validate that, but I suppose it's an example maybe that people are mentioning in relation yeah. to, to dock yeah. control. Exactly. And I mean, I, I, they're, 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 what's great is that there, there's loads of feedback we get about certain things, certain biological systems, certain controls that, that, that farmers will observe in the field. Uh, it might be anecdotal, but that doesn't mean it's valid. Uh, but it's, it's incumbent on us to validate it through science and to be objective about it. W one of our challenges are the resources where we're like every unit in, in uh, across the public sector, resources are finite. So we, we have to prioritize certain things. And, and that's why our work is focusing in on the main diseases, the ones that require the heavy chemical inputs at the moment. And I suppose is are, are, are there similar areas around Europe where they have the same level of pressure or are we really a little bit unique in terms of the disease pressures in particular, I suppose maybe a little bit less on pest side, on the pest side. Yeah. But, so, but does that point to us really needing to, to put resources in, 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 into this area? Yeah. Yeah. So we, we, we are unique in probably in that the climate we have in regards to climate, but then intensification, you would look to the Netherlands for potato production. They would have very intensive production systems where they're looking at 15 or more sprays per season which is a huge amount of, of load going out on a crop, obviously a huge cost. Um, so they, they, they are focusing really heavily on a rapid development of resistant material because they know they have to um, in regard to that. You mentioned pests as well. I suppose what's important to take away is that we're, we're seeing different pest migrations up through Europe. So there are various different associations monitoring pest migration and, and the incidence of novel pests and diseases. And, and as climates shift and change, where those pests are migrating, um, and we would anticipate in time, uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, there will be new pests landing on, on the shores of Ireland. Uh, and that's where those IPM measures, again, we would then be looking to colleagues in, in, in Southern Europe and saying, look, when that pest landed on your shores, what did you try? What worked? More importantly, what didn't work? Because we don't want to be investing time and effort in, in actions that didn't deliver previously. And I suppose when you look at particularly as well, 
all of the crops we grow, but the cost of, of your, your plant protection products and particularly your fungicides are a very significant portion now of the uh, cost base. Yeah. And I suppose, is there a thinking about the, the potential for an acceptable loss of yield mm. uh, it, uh, co corresponding with a, a reduction in, in uh, pesticide use? So there, there was a study done uh, by Wageningen University um, earlier in the year, which, which looked just at that, and I suppose an, an over the horizon scoping study on the potential impact of farm to fork across European production systems. Um, and just like you said, of course, if, if you cut the use of, of pesticides, you reduce the cost of using those pesticides. But the, the, the drop in productivity and yield and quality was significant. So it, it will undermine the profitability of, of certain systems. Um, that is that that's that's pretty certain if sorry I should clarify if it's adopted you know right now with the systems we have at the moment so we will we we are planning to do more work uh, in 2023 on that social and economic impact because we need to get into more detail about it in terms of each individual systems uh, and then across a whole rotation there's a question there in relation to uh, who is going to do the the, the work and the the, the mix uh, I suppose the mix in workload between advisors and farmers themselves engaging in the, in the, in this space, where do you see that that going? And and are we well enough re resourced with support for farmers to move as we need to move in this direction? Well, I I, I think I'd be shooting myself in the foot if I said you know we we wouldn't accept more resources, <laughs> but but to be fair, no, we 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 we're we're in a good place, but of course we we of course we could do with more. Um, I think what, what's a real asset is, is the, the collaboration between research and KT colleagues um, and then through the Signpost Farm Network. I mean, that, that's going to have a huge role to play because we need to be able to demonstrate these systems in a very clear, understandable way for farmers. Because, of course, there's going to be a lot of reluctance, you know, to, to, to move away from a system that gives pretty much 100 percent insurance on protecting that yield to move to a system that... Uh, well, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll make you question, um, you know, with any new change like that, there has to be reassurance and that reassurance can only come through clear demonstration. Is the, uh, uh, I suppose, in, in non-cereal crops, is the requirement for an absolutely clean uh, product at consumer level hmm. leading to a, a problem potentially with overuse of, of plant protection products? So, yes, it, it, I mean, like you, you walk into a supermarket and you see fruit and veg and it looks like sometimes it's almost been painted, you know, it, it, it's and the consumer has that that perception of that perfect product has been has been presented. Um, but, you know, as we know, and, and farmers go to a huge amount of trouble or trouble effort and, and expense. You look at the horticultural market as well. Um, the, the amount of product that's rejected because it doesn't make that that consumer required quality box uh, is, is is huge. Um, so there, there, there has to be a change in, in attitudes among consumers as well about what to expect. Um, quality has to be maintained. That, that, that's a given. But the, the drive for the reduction in, in pesticide use, um, you know, has definitely has merits, of course, in, in terms of protection, protecting waterways and biodiversity. Um, but there, there is a trade-off with all these actions. And one of the trade-offs is that, you know, food prices would be predicted to increase because productivity, the risk of productivity decreasing uh, is matched against it. So, so the question is, you know, if consumers want all these things, the question is, are they willing to pay for these things? Um, and there is evidence for certain systems to show that that's not always the case. And the downside to that is that it puts even more pressure on the primary producers. I, I suppose, Pat, just to follow up kind of a little bit on that, I suppose, what you know, you would you have any idea in relation to farmers' attitudes to IPM? Obviously, it involves a greater level of risk, I suppose, yeah. you know, and ultimately, you know, farmers probably need a bit more assurance and product price, I suppose. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, like I, I haven't met anybody who isn't risk averse. Uh, and when you have an enterprise, when you're looking at the, the cost of establishment of crops this year alone, you know, show, farmers are shouldering huge costs to establish crops that they'll be harvesting, you know, late into August and September next year. Um, so to suggest an alternative system 
uh, that is, is moving away from something that they have known for 30 years plus uh, is going to need a lot of demonstration and, and reassurance. And that's why I suppose we're putting those efforts into developing those model varieties with colleagues, because that material is, is the way to show how a certain pathway can be developed towards minimizing the risk. But it's not about, it, we won't be able to eliminate the risk. That's, that's, that's a really important point to make. It's about minimizing it as much as possible so that the economic uh, risk is reduced. Uh, and uh, there's a question in there about how uh, about the achievability of the 50% reduction by mm -hmm. by 2030. Is it a, a realistic goal? Is it a stretch yeah. target or, or uh, is yeah. it just unachievable? It's, no, I mean, look, it, it, it's it, it's mandated under the sustainable use regulation, you know, so we, we there isn't much scope to move the goalposts on this one uh, with current systems. Uh, achievable if it was introduced as I said we would have a loss in productivity we would have crops going out of production because farmers would not be able to, to it wouldn't it wouldn't make any sense economic sense to uh, to grow them um, and and that would have a huge impact socially uh, and economically on on the tillage sector and the sectors that rely on the tillage sector for that product for food and feed um, so that's why I suppose in the next seven eight years we really need to ramp up our, our, our approaches to IPM. We need to ensure that, that we have full buy-in from the sector because one person doesn't have all the answers to this. Um, and already through you know, the farmers we have through, through networks and, and signposts as well, there are many different uh, things out there that farmers are trying. Uh, and this helps us because it gives us a heads up on maybe certain techniques that, that we can look at. There's also many techniques, I have to say, on the internet that, that people will say, you know, I've tried this and it worked really well. Um, it's really important that all of these approaches, that there is objectivity uh, to, to support any conclusions that are made on them. There's a question in there about the uh, degree to which the PPPs are being found in, in uh, food and water. And I know there's been a, a recent uh, uh, report uh, where they have been tracking uh, 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 pesticide or herbicides in 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 water, and a concerted effort has led to very substantial reductions. Mm. Uh, are we looking at the same thing in relation to food? Uh, are there uh, gains that can be made there in the short term? So I think I, I think I'm, the the monitoring of food for pesticides is obviously something that that is ongoing constantly by you know, the Food Safety Authority and other European associations and regular and and regulatory bodies, um, and and I, one of the drivers you know back to 2009 when the Sustainable Use Directive came out was the goal was to to ensure that any products that are being are being applied don't end up in the food chain, uh, or in waterways. So with, with farm to fork, that is, you know, I suppose that's the next chapter of it to try and minimize the chance of anything like this getting into waterways and, and into food systems. Um, so if, if you reduce the use, uh, obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're eliminating the, any, any more potential chance of that material entering into, into, into food production systems. But it's really important to say that, that, you know, food production in Ireland and across Europe has advanced so much in the last 20, 30 years, uh, monitoring, surveillance, all that for, for products, PPPs, but all sorts of other elements as well, uh, toxins, et cetera, is, is now standard. Uh, and to be fair, it's a credit to organizations across Europe for, for maintaining the quality of food. Okay, I think we're going to have to call a halt. It's, believe it or not, it's, it's, it's 10 30. I'd, I'd just like to thank both of you. Uh, an excellent presentation, and I think a lot of credit due, uh, particularly to the, the the guys involved in the breeding programs and and the work that they're doing. It's it's uh, work that's that's uh, has an impact on a on a world scale. Uh, so a, a lot of credit due to them. So thank you very much, Ewan, for your presentation, and Kieran for 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 uh, dealing with questions. Uh, next week uh our, will be our 50th and final webinar for 2022 and and continuing on the tillage team will be joined by uh, michael hennessy head of crops uh, knowledge transfer uh looking at the question can uh the tillage sector contribute to climate resilience in ireland so we look forward to that next week uh 
Uh, we'd like to thank our production team of uh, Yvonne Maher and Andy Boland uh, and stay safe in this chilly uh, and uh, weather out there and be careful if it's if it snows. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat.